Okay, we'll, uh, we'll make a start. Um, hello and welcome everyone to the NNA's first ever webinar, tonight featuring Clive Bates, and we will be discussing uh, the question, the TPD review, is it an opportunity or a catastrophe? For those who are not familiar with Zoom, um, firstly, we'll have some uh, uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, you'll notice that you're muted and the screen sharing is also off. So um, you won't be able to speak to us apart from through the Q&A and you won't be thrown up on screen uh, at an inopportune moment. So don't worry about that. Um, Clive will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, then I'll maybe ask a couple of questions and then we'll get on with the Q&A. Uh, we're going to keep it to time, but we'll get as many questions asked answered as we can. Um, you need to find the Q&A function if you're not uh, uh, familiar with Zoom, like I said. If you're on Zoom on a PC in the app, you'll find it at the bottom of the screen. If you're on a tablet or a phone, you should be able to touch the screen and you see the icon at the top, I think. Um, it's very easy to find. It, it's just a, a square with Q&A written on it. So find that and find yourself familiar with that because that's where you can ask your questions. There is a chat function, but if anything goes in there, we won't see the question that won't get asked. Uh, you don't need to wait to ask questions. Once Clive starts speaking, you can post your questions in there if, if he says anything interesting that you'd like to, uh, that you know, you think a question would uh, arise out of it. And in the question, in the Q and A, when the question comes up, you'll see that next to it has a thumbs up sign. If you click on this, it upvotes the question, and the more upvotes it gets, the further up the screen it gets, and the more uh, popular it is. And if it's more popular, more likely it is to get asked. So do look out for that as well. Um, we'd like to say, because obviously we rely on your support here, that. We'd like to get donations from this. This is already costing us money, just having a Zoom account, which very kindly you all broke by turning up in your droves, uh, which means we have to rethink that in future. But if you can donate, we, you can go on our website after this, if you think that um, we deserve any donations, of course, and there are plenty of options there, but one way you can do it right now, if you're in the UK, you could donate by text. You just simply text NNA with a space, the amount of your donation, say 10, 20, however much, and text it to 70085, that's 70085. So you can text us a donation anytime during this or afterwards, if you like. So without further ado, we're gonna introduce Clive. Um, Clive has worked in private industry. Many of you know who, who he's already, obviously. He's also worked in the charity sector. He was an advisor to the Blair government as a civil servant on their strategy unit, former director of ASH, which many of you know. He's now a consultant on good government sustainability energy, environment, and public health, the last of which we know from his renowned support for tobacco harm reduction. So Clive, welcome. Um, Hi, before, we start, before we start, we're gonna do a quick poll to find out and to gauge opinion about what, what people think of the TP, TPD review and what they expect out of it. I think we've got a poll to see what you're expecting out of it. So what threat level do you think the TPD review poses? A high threat, a mid threat, no threat whatsoever, or will it be beneficial? So get your answers in there. And um, so Clive, the TPD review, tell us yep. something about it. What can we expect? And what do you think the outcomes are gonna be based on what we said, opportunity or, or a threat? All right. Let, let, me, let me just go back a step, uh, talk about the history. Um, we're basically, um, we've had two tobacco product directives so far, the first in 2001, the second in 2014, and that's the, the current one. The big battle over the uh, 2014 one all took place in 2013. Um, and you know there was an epic victory in there for uh, vapors and tobacco harm reduction. I'll come back to that in a minute. But I think it's important to understand what these directives are. They are agreements uh, amongst the European Union member states and institutions to regulate tobacco products and tobacco related products, which is vaping products, in a particular way. And this is done as part of the single market uh, agenda of the European Union. So they harmonize standards of products um, that in theory enables the internal market to function more fluently. 
Um, they're not allowed to do anything they want. Um, they can't, there's certain things that they can't do that are reserved for member states. So for example, things like age restrictions, uh, vaping restrictions in public places, advertising that is not transboundary and so on. Those are things that are reserved for the member states. The things that tend to be done at EU level relate to the product formulation itself, the packaging and marketing and advertising that crosses borders. So all of those things are in play in the Tobacco Products Directive, okay? Now, the 2014 directive contained a provision within it in Article 28 for a review, and that review has to be conducted and completed by the 20th of May 2021, okay, which is about five years after the main provisions of the directive came into, into effect. Um, and uh, the, the headline target that was supposed to be achieved was a 2% reduction in smoking uh, brought on by the, the directive by 2021. Something ironically, they won't even be able to measure in time for the review of the directive to be complete, but they won't be deterred by that. Now, the, the review uh, is an interesting thing. They will look at the uh, application and effect of the directive and look for any gaps or problems or changes in technology or the economic landscape that have happened that require them to look again at the directive and see whether it needs to be updated. So the review under this Article 28 will give them the mandate to come up with a new proposal. And that new proposal uh, will come from the European Commission and will go to the Parliament and the Council. Um, and it will go through something called the Ordinary Legislative Procedure. Now, it's important to understand what these bodies are. The Commission is like the civil service of the European Union, and it proposes legislation. In that respect, it's a bit different from the, government, the UK government's civil service, but it proposes the legislation and does all the technical work to justify it, the impact assessments, the consultations, and so on. The European uh, Council are representatives of the member uh, states. So there will be ministers or senior officials that go along to working group meetings. And then the representatives that we vote for during the European elections. We no longer in the UK have uh, representatives in the European Parliament or the EU Council. Okay, now the Parliament and the Council together form the legislature and it's them that actually pass the, the the next version of the TPD if there is one if they like the commission if there is a commission proposal and the parliament and the um, European Council like it that's how the process finds its way onto the books and becomes legislation okay so those three institutions are the key ones to understand properly now, Vapors scored a massive victory uh, against the Commission and the Council in 2013. And I remember the date, it's marked in my mind, October the 8th, 2013. Vapors, through their uh, incredible lobbying and campaigning and advocacy effort in the European Parliament, managed to overturn the Commission proposal to medicalise the regulation of e-cigarettes which was largely backed by the council and including by the British representative, the UK representatives on the council. And it was the parliament, the democratically elected members of the European institutions, listening to vapors, listening to tobacco harm reduction arguments that, put, that reversed that. And that would have been a terrible outcome in that directive. So one thing I want to stress here is that the role of vapors, ordinary citizens, their consumer representatives, the producer representatives, and tobacco harm reduction advocates such as myself is incredibly important in terms of uh, using a democratic pushback against the sort of insider elitism of the council and the commission. And you should not underestimate the power and agency even if these bodies that vapors have, even if these bodies appear to be able to exclude you 
from the process in the early stages. You can win big in the parliament, but you just have to work at it. A um, couple of things to say. Uh, we don't have to wait till May 2021 to get involved. The process is already underway. There are about four or five work streams that are going into forming the uh, review under Article 28 that will complete in May 2021, may be delayed, who knows, but that's the target date. Um, there is, so those, those processes are going on, on already, and I'm pleased to say NNA and the new EFRA grouping have already been effective in helping vapors have their voice heard in those processes but there will be more to do later this year. Um, I think it's also important to keep an eye on the World Health Organization FCTC Conference of the Parties, which has now been delayed, but that is likely to be, uh, that will be in November next year. It's possible that that will be influenced by the report of the European um, Commission uh, and that it will set up the commission for the next phase of the, uh, the directive. In my view, to answer your question, finally, uh, after a long tour around the houses, Martin, to me, this is all threat. I don't see any good coming from this whatsoever. I don't see any of the bad, me bad measures being rolled back. I'd like to be proved wrong. Uh, maybe the ban on snooze, maybe lifted, who knows? But I see it as all downside, particularly a risk to flavors, particularly a risk to products requiring authorization or flavors requiring authorization, black lists of ingredients, possibly even white lists of ingredients. In other words, lists of what's allowed rather than what's not allowed. Um, I would be um, worried potentially that extra burdens would be imposed uh, on um, smaller businesses, that it will be harder to justify open systems and so on. The, the lists are, are fairly endless. Uh, the, co the commission has been contaminated with the same kind of thinking that the WHO has. It's been picked up a lot of the garbage that comes across the Atlantic from the United States, the Ivali uh, crisis, the youth vaping epidemic, um, the uh, moral panic about flavors and e-cigarettes. Some of that is beginning to infect the way Europeans are, are thinking about this. So I don't see any good at all coming out of this. So I'll end my closing remarks at, uh, at that point, if that's OK. Um, and we can move into a more informal discussion, Martin. Well, thanks very much for that, um, Clive. A, a nice little dose of utter doom and gloom to start <laughs> our Thursday evening off with. <laughs> um, yeah, you thank don't you. get me on for good news, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me let me put something else to you. Let, I, I've I've seen many vapors and uh, UK vapors, and and they have a different opinion. They they kind of think the government's got their back on this. So let, let's explore that a little bit. So I will play devil's advocate. Come on, Public Health England is on our side. You've, we've got Cancer Research UK. It's in the Tobacco Control Plan that vaping products should be more available to smokers. Stoptober even advertised these things or shown them on their adverts. Yeah. Boris is one of the architects of Brexit. He, he's not going to let the Eurocrats bully him around and push him around, is he? Come on, isn't this just, um, isn't this it's just we're all right, Union Jack in the UK and we've got nothing to worry about? <laughs> well, there's about 10 different things to say about that. Um, for, first of all, uh, let's, take a, let's take a broader view. The EU is a regulatory superpower and what it decides has an effect everywhere uh, and can have an effect everywhere. So I, I've, just finished, I've just finished working on a submission that relates to the Philippines, for example. They've copied some of the worst aspects of EU regulation. So, for example, the uh, 20 milligram limit, for, for example. Um, so we in the UK, we should have a slightly internationalist view of this and look beyond our own shores, okay? And see this as affecting the climate for vaping products, innovation, new businesses, public health globally, not just taking a parochial UK stance. So that's my first point. The second thing though, is I would not rely on uh, Public Health England and the Department of Health 
and Cancer UK, uh, Cancer Research UK, etc. Um, first, first thing is it is possible, and we don't know what's going to happen with Brexit yet. Remember, but it is possible uh, that the UK will agree to remain harmonised with the uh, EU in a number of areas whilst remaining outside the EU. That is that is possible. I'm not saying it's definite, but it's possible, uh, and. It would be done uh, as a way of uh, reducing the amount of friction there is between, in trade between the UK and uh, the EU, okay? More likely, I think, is that the UK will have the discretion to change its regulation um, and make it out of step with the EU, but it won't, it will choose not to exercise that discretion uh, unless the problems coming from the EU are so egregious uh, that it's it really the government really doesn't want to you know really doesn't want to um, comply with it. Now the reason the reason for this is I think the EU the UK wants to show that it has cut itself free and it can regulate differently, but it doesn't necessarily want to bear the costs of doing that and doesn't necessarily want to be different just for the sake of it. So let's see what actually happens. But I would not count on uh, them choosing that particular hill to die on from a, for a divergence from EU regulation. There, there may be other areas that they would think were more important to diverge from the EU. And then uh, finally, even if they do diverge, you can't really be sure uh, that they'll diverge in a way that is good and is you know kind of in any way sort of helpful so i would not be complacent about this you've got a huge superpower on the doorstep if it's going to go negative on vaping it's going to affect the whole world and the whole region including the uk it's our fight in the uk not just for international reasons although it's that as well but also for uk reasons Okay, well, that that kind of answers a second question I was going to say is like, why should we in the UK fight for Johnny Foreigner, if you like? So what you're basically saying is it's in our own interest to to fight this on an international level and not just to be insular and just to expect our government to help us no. out. So, so I'll, 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 enlightened self-interest, altruistic yeah. view of other vapors and the cause of public health. You don't have to do things that are only for yourself. Um, and also, by the way, it just occurred to me, I, I didn't mention this, but watch out for the devolved administrations. Um, you know, they see Brexit as an English project, okay? And they're very keen to remain aligned with the, um, uh, with the EU. So you might find trouble in Wales, Scotland, especially in Northern Ireland, which, you know, is sort of contractually obliged to stay much closer to the EU. So again, there's interests around the... UK, you also you also want UK vaping companies to have markets in the European Union. You want them to be successful enterprises as well. You know, it's a public health business as well as a consumer phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, good point. Very good point. Before we move on, we've got plenty of questions. Okay. I just want to ask because it's been in the news this week. It's a separate directive. We yeah. know this, but that there's been talk, and uh, I think it was yesterday or today that it's been accepted that vaping products and safer nicotine products are going to be included in the EU tax directive. Yeah. So just very briefly on that, because it's a different yeah. kind of subject, but can you just explain, because I think a lot of people think instantly there's going to be tax on these products yeah. straight away, but it's not quite like that, is it? No, it's not like that. Um, it's a very good point, Martin. It's, 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 it's a don't panic yet uh, kind of thing. I mean, the main thing that these directives do is harmonize definitions, procedures, the way things are counted and measured, what the tax base is. Um, you know, they sometimes set minimum and maximum limits for excise taxation to harmonize. Okay, now that is generally all quite, that's for the most part quite good. Actually, it simplifies the arrangements and it means that the businesses involved in this are only have one set of uh, tax type arrangements to deal with in every country in the EU. So that's beneficial. It mean, and it means you don't get mad definitions coming in. It means everybody, every country involved has agreed 
uh, you have to have unanimity on tax directives, so that's all good. What you want, though, is the freedom to set the tax rates, which is always in the gift of member states, never in the gift of the EU, at zero. So the key thing is to watch out for any future tax directive allowing for zero or even negative um, minimum tax rates um, in, the, uh, in the directive. And then, then it's basically not so much to worry about. And I think, right. that, I think right. that would be yeah. the case. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, there's, pl there's plenty of mileage to go on that uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, it's good, uh, the, but there are risks. Okay, we've got some, we've got plenty of questions, like I said, but I'll try and combine some of these. Uh, we've had one from Richard Ivers who said, do you expect the opposition to vaping will be fiercer this time from lobbying and scaremongering, etc." And And Darren Haley wants to know if anything would be, any will be kept from the TPD from last time or will it all just be changing? So um, I expect the, the, the lobbying to be better organised. Uh, it's been going on longer. Um, there's already been meetings like the European uh, Conference on Tobacco or Health, which have had resolutions well attended by uh, European Commission officials um, who made sort of anti-vaping speeches. Um, they are in big. There are groups like the European Respiratory Society, the Union, the massive uh, kind of uh, onslaught of Bloomberg funded um, groups. They're all out there. They've all got tons of money and they've got an agenda now that is more coherent. I mean, it's bullshit, but it's more coherent than it was before, internally coherent. So they've got youth vaping epidemic, flavours, industry is seen as an industry plot to hook young people on nicotine to catch them as customers for life. So the nicotine agenda is much stronger than it was, the flavours agenda much stronger than it was, um, and they are better organised and there's more of them with more money. Right. And uh, the other one, the other one about the, the TPD, the TPD is an incremental thing. So We've had TP1 in 2001, TPD2, TPD2 kept a lot of that, um, and then TPD3 will keep a lot of TPD2, but we'll change it at the margins. It, it, it's a sort of almost like a ratcheting effect. Everything, everything that's bad in TPD2 will probably be kept, and some new bad things will be added as well, um, uh, or the bad things in it will be made worse. Well, on, on everything that's being, it will be kept, we, we've got a question on, on that, actually. Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, it. It's about the bottle sizes. I'll, I'll find it and, and yeah. click on it in there. But someone's asked about the bottle sizes. Uh, bottle sizes. This, this is a, a thing that goes completely against other EU directives on plastic yeah. waste and single-use yeah. plastics. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a good argument um, for us to use to say that, sh that at least should be discarded? Look, there's great arguments on all the main uh, issues uh, it, with the current directive. You know, the ban on advertising, the bottle size, the tank size, the silly insert uh, that's required, um, the warnings are excessive, and so on. There are good arguments on all of these things, and we, we should, uh, and we will, of course, we will get them all worked through. But that, that is a particularly good one. And it, it may be it's that sort of thing that the legislature would be willing to give away um, because they don't think it's particularly important. So that might be something that you could get in some kind of horse trading over, you know, streamlining the directive. And as you say, bring in arguments about plastic. So, uh, or, you know, container sizes or the amount of fiddling that's involved and all the rest of it. So there are, there are particularly good arguments for that, but there are good arguments for all, all points where the, the directive is, you know, basically harmful to the interests of uh, vapors. My sense is we will have to put most of our energy into fighting off new bad ideas rather than reversing the existing bad ideas. But, you know, the two things go hand in hand in some senses. Um, and we should be as proactive as possible about all of these things. On that, on that subject, you say there are arguments to be made. 
while we've got a, a fair amount of va vapors in here and users of safer nicotine products other than vaping, how do we go about it? What is the best thing that vapors should be doing right now and, right. and in the future? Okay, so the, f the first thing to understand is that the EU processes are incredibly difficult to follow and opaque, and they are very resistant to input from sort of ordinary people. Um, so the, fir the first thing to do is to build up organizations that have a bit of capacity to do that on your behalf, okay? To um, support groups like the NNA and EFRA, which I think is actually a, like a holding group for all the consumer organizations, they will be your guide through this process. So the thing you need to do is get your hand in your pocket, hand them some money, and then wait for the alerts to come from them and they will guide you. Okay, that is the way to do it. I'm also hoping to put my effort in behind these groups and to, to help them have the, the biggest impact they can possibly have. So that is a that's code for get organized and get other people to do the organizing for you. Doesn't mean do nothing. It means join these organizations, be responsive to their requests. The second area is ultimately this works through the democratic uh, lightning rods that we have. So you need, you need to be building up uh, you know, a rapport with your MPs and your MEPs, okay? Um, you need to, and do, the, do this in response to prompting from these organizations rather than ad hoc, because they'll make sure you land this effectively. But individual vapors need to start being able to tell their story and to handle the arguments around this um, with their democratically elected representatives at EU level and at local level. The organizations, uh, the, the consumer organizations in each country also need to be building rapport with the council members. That is the departments of health and the officials that go to the working groups. So that's how you begin to influence something as big as the EU process. Uh, you have to, it's very difficult to have any rapport or involvement with the European Commission, but what you're trying to do is to get your influence with the more responsive and democratic parts of the system that you have leverage with, which is the member states, the council and the lo local government parliaments and the European Parliament. Right. I can certainly endorse your message to donate to the NNA. Um, so I'll just Good. remind people again that you can do that if you're in the UK by text, text NNA plus your donation to 70085, if I haven't mentioned that already. Um, do mention it because it's really important. The, I mean, I, I know from my point of view, the most important thing in these in sort of advocacy in this area is to have credible consumer organisations that are not sort of compromised by um, kind of industry conflicts of interest that really genuinely speak for the users with kind of articulate smart people who understand the process that's going on and then can help you as individuals engage in the process as well as engaging themselves. That is the secret source for lobbying and advocacy in this type of uh, legislative process. Right, so let's talk on the, the other side of lobbying. Uh, we have a question from Mark Dickinson or two questions, but I'll put them together. Uh, to what extent do the tentacles of Michael Bloomberg and his funded organisations reach the EU? Uh, and if it's not him, who is influencing the anti-vaping policy of the EU Commission? Right. Well, that's a, that's a good question from Mark. Um, I mean, the, I, I've started calling it the, uh, the sort of Bloomberg propaganda complex now because it's not just Bloomberg. It's all the intermediaries that Bloomberg funds, like Vital Strategies, um, like Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. He's a bun he funds a bunch of organizations in uh, Europe, whose names I can't just recall at the moment, I don't want to get wrong um, publicly, but he is his foundation and his money is everywhere. And Bloomberg is on record during his presidential, abortive presidential campaign, saying he thinks it would be a good idea to ban vaping products outright. So we have a prohibitionist benefactor 
spraying money around the world and the uh, EU and, and for that matter in WHO. And all of those messages are all sort of coming from him. Um, I would say though that that isn't the only problem. If you took them out of the picture, the problem wouldn't go away. Um, I, and I'm, I've been asked this question so many times is why, why is public health so opposed to vaping? It's a massive, you know, I'm not, I think it's a brilliant idea. I think you save thousands of lives and deal with the smoking epidemic, end of story. Um, why are so many against it? Well, what you've got is something that is antithetical to their playbook. You've got the free play of consumers, innovators in a lightly regulated market, addressing the health problem of smoking on their own initiative and at their own expense. Public health not involved. It's a market transaction, okay? And that is not what gets them excited and gets them out of bed and gets them to work. Their playbook is full of punitive measures, coercions, restrictions, stigma, treatment, medicalizing problems into uh, you know, a, a, a patient illness cure sort of model. So this is not where they're coming from instinctively. And this is why originally they were so keen to medicalize vaping and these products and to ban things like snus, because it's not in their playbook. That is not how they see things getting better. And that mindset not only pervades Bloomberg, but it also pervades groups like the European Respiratory Society, the Union, uh, many of the health organizations, the anti-smoking organizations. And it's a sorry sight because it means they care more about the way things are done than what is actually achieved. And the way things are done have to be done according to them by their playbook. So it's the, it's the we didn't invent this syndrome, basically. It's we didn't invent it and we don't like it. It's not mm -hmm. how we want things done. Okay. Well, it, this leads nicely onto a, a question here from John Fell. Just to, another point about the question. Some people are putting them in chat. I can't see them in chat. So please put them in the Q&A where I can. Oh, Otherwise, oh. they won't get out. So they, they won't have much chance of being asked. Uh, John Fell has asked, uh, and it follows on from what you're saying about how they have their agenda. Uh, does the UK exit mean that the progressive voice on vaping and good evidence on the positive impact of vaping is less likely to be heard? How can UK vapors help? Well, yes, basically. Um, I mean, you, you know, you've got the trade off we discussed earlier. You know, does this mean does this mean the UK is somehow safe from uh, bad EU regulation? Well, I, I it may be, but I, I don't think you can count on that. But definitely definitely we will miss the influence of UK vapors um, and advocates and organizations and the Department of Health and Public Health England in the development of TPD3. Um, I mean, to the extent that they can do anything, they're generally a moderating and pragmatic force and would be a force for good and for the interests of vapors. We no longer have representatives in the commission, we're not represented in the European Council. We're not on the working groups. We're not in the expert groups. We have no MEPs anymore. Uh, we are basically out of the room. Uh, and it means that uh, groups like NNA, if it wants to be effective, will have to work by proxy through um, other European organizations like EFRA or in partnership with the other organizations. And we, when you look at what happened in 2013, the UK MEPs, you know, people like Rebecca Taylor, for example, um, were really, really important in changing the dynamic around, uh, uh, around you know, um, um, uh, what's his name, Martin, uh, um, oh, Callanan? Callanan, yeah, mm -hmm. Martin Callanan, with very, very, the Conservative, very, very important. And actually, they were important in seeing off, um, you know, the, the, the supposedly progressive Labour side uh, of MEPs in the European Parliament. So we, we've lost something really important in terms of the, our influence on this process. I'm sorry to say uh, it was inevitable. Maybe we'll gain something in return. I'm sceptical about that. So, so you don't personally think that in these trade agreement uh, talks that are, are being talked about at the moment that 
the UK will have any influence over the EU at all in this. It, 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 it's just it's just something they'll just throw on the bonfire and maybe maybe trade it for something better or something more important to the public than vaping. Well, I, I, the trade agreement the trade agreement won't come down to negotiating the the terms of directives. Um, I think it's possible because everything's going to be concerned, you know, everything will be considered in a much wider context. It's possible that we will A, be required to sign up to these directives, and particularly because of the complexity of the arrangements governing the border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. I mean, this is yet to be faced, but Northern Ireland has to stick much closer to EU regulation. So to the extent that Great Britain diverges from the EU, it's also diverging from Northern Ireland. Okay, and that creates a lot of political problems within the United Kingdom. So I don't think we will be diverging from EU regulation unless we really have to, okay, unless it's seen as absolutely essential to do that. Um, it may be that we have the freedom to do that, but I suspect it will be a freedom that we don't really act on uh, that easily. So can, va can vapors have a voice there by just pressuring government? Can we just bombard MPs and maybe tell them that this is this is important? It's not something uh, that isn't. You know, you talk about fisheries well, and you talk about I, Nissan making cars, but this is important to millions of people. I, I, well, M MPs are not really involved in the trade uh, agreements. One of the one of the one of the things that the Johnson government did um, in its sort of rush to dictatorship was. Uh, to exclude Parliament from having much of a role in the trade agreements, including in terms of scrutinising them. So we're not seeing Parliament having much effect there. But I think the point is, Martin, the trade agreements will be conducted at a kind of higher level than this. This will, this will be in the noise in the trade agreement, uh, and it will either be in or out or it will it it will it will not be a big issue in terms of the way the trade agreement is settled. Certainly, if it has to be settled by the end of this year, um, it's just too in the weeds for them to uh, agree. They'll be much more focused on state aids, subsidies, competition, procurement uh, areas where there might be a race to the bottom. You know, environment, labour standards, that kind of thing. Um, than they will be on these sort of, you know, of course, fisheries and farming. Right, I'm, I'm being invaded by a cat at the moment, trying to keep, keep her out of the way, but um, I knew it would happen. Uh, just, we've got more questions here. Uh, there's one, I, I want to ask this one, it's not right at the top, but I think it's an important subject. And also it's from an anonymous attendee. Now I didn't mention that, that you can, so the cat again, you can, ask questions anonymously if, if you okay. choose to, someone's found it. Uh, you mentioned flavours in your opening statement. What chance do you think that flavours are totally banned under the TPD? Uh, well, it's like non-zero chance. I mean, obviously by flavours, the, uh, the world is sort of in, in completely insane about this. Uh, they, you know, they've got in their minds that tobacco flavour, menthol, flavor and maybe mint flavor are somehow qualitatively different from the other flavors because those are associated with you know tobacco use you can get menthol cigarettes and everything um i i it's too early to call a probability on this all i would say is that it's a clear and present danger what they may do uh is do a sort of pseudo ban and say well you can have flavors providing they have been added to this list and have been proven to be safe, for example. So every flavor you would have you would have would have to uh, be proven safe and there would be a procedure for doing that or something like that. Um, they could um, uh, they, they could define a bunch of flavors that they believe are somehow attractive to children and outlaw them, although I think that's technically difficult to to do. Um, in my view, if they're going to regulate flavors, they should be regulating things that have uh, are chemically toxic in some way and, and not trying to use flavor regulations to address the appeal of the product. Uh, you do that through marketing and age restrictions. Um, 
I would rather see flavor descriptors regulated than the actual chemical flavors or the, you know, the sensory impact of flavors, you know, rather, you know, stupid branding that's aimed at children or looks like it's aimed at children regulated rather than uh, the, the actual chemicals themselves. Uh, but all of this is to play for. Yeah, and we're, we're going to have a, a, a big role as consumers in to trying to do our, our best to stop it, I, I presume. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to master the arguments around flavours, which are a little bit subtle, because obviously if you ban all flavours, the products as a whole become less attractive, both to adults and to young people. So it's, you know, I always use the analogy of pizza toppings. You know, if you banned all pizza toppings, pizzas would become less attractive and less young people would eat them and less people in general would eat them. Or if you only had margarita pizzas, the pizza restaurants would not be particularly full. You know, so it's not that it's not that flavors aren't part of the appeal. The question is what's so special about them um, that you would you would ban them in order to protect young people from doing something that is basically uh, using what is basically an adult product. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, please, everyone, find the upvote button on these questions. There's plenty to get through, um, and it'd be easier for me if you upvote the ones that you all find very popular. Some of you are finding it, some aren't. We've got a rather technical question here. Oh, How do you think this will impact the UK and the tobacco-related products review happening at the same time? I mean, but basically, will we, will we mirror our legislation at the same time, or will we take, take what's happening in the EU before we do it? Uh, what order do you think well, that's we, we're some way off this. I mean, just just to give you an idea of the time, I'd be very surprised if there's a new directive in force by uh, 2024. If you just look at the timetable for doing all of this, it takes a long time to go through the Parliament and Council. Then, then you then you have a new directive that would appear in 2024. And then that would have a period of maybe one or two, you know, maybe one year, maybe 18 months for the language to be transposed into member state regulation. And at that point, the UK would have to decide whether it wants to update its tobacco and tobacco you know, related product regulation, which is the thing that implements the TPD2. But as I say, we're, we're probably five or six years away from that at the moment. Uh, and we would have to see what was in it before the UK decided if it had the freedom to diverge from the EU, whether it was going to exercise that freedom and not implement some of the provisions, um, or whether it was going to diverge from the EU before that, if it, if it wanted to do that. But as I say, there's various reasons why I think that's quite unlikely. Right, yeah. Well, we've spoken a lot about consumers so far, and obviously NNA is a consumer association, but obviously this is going to attract interest from industry as well. And we've got um, a couple of points from, uh, from here. We've got an anonymous attendee says, what would you want to see the vaping industry do? Uh, and mm -hmm. having seen the 2013-14 process firsthand, what do you expect the vaping industry would do? And I'll, I'll add in as well a question from James Dunworth, uh, from e-cigarette direct who says do you see nicotine and short fields being brought into the regulations um all right let's first of all the industry um it just needs to organize its i mean it's pretty good for the most part it's got some good trade associations now it needs to organize itself professionally professionalize itself master the arguments um it needs to stop it needs to stop doing this ridiculous, reg what I call regulatory arbitrage, where one company thinks, oh, I'm a bricks and mortar business. Let me see if I can shaft the online businesses. Or, oh, I sell open systems. Let me see if I can shaft the pods. That is not the way to do things. The way to do things is to create a broad front in favor of the, the overall category and concept of vaping as an alternative to smoking. I try to find place, a place for everybody in the regulatory agenda that you put forward. Um, for goodness sake, and this, um, if anyone's on from Juul, for goodness sake, stop handing out, you know, hostages, making concessions for no reason. These are just banked. These are just banked by your opponents and then they move on to the next kind of big club to beat you with, okay? So don't do that. The whole thing needs to be formulated 
around the concept of uh, risk proportionate regulation. It needs to be grounded in an understanding that what you do with vaping and heated tobacco products, smokeless nicotine pouches, also has an effect on what happens with smoking. And these things cannot be regulated in isolation. They have to be regulated with both, uh, both things in mind, okay? And therefore you have to be mindful of the concept of unintended consequences. You make it harder to vape, you make it easier to smoke. You make it more expensive. Uh, you know, the Royal College of Physicians put this very well, make it more expensive, less pharmacologically satisfying, less appealing, harder to access, basically you're prolonging smoking. And we need to get that argument over. We really need to get over the idea of unintended consequences and excessive regulation of vaping is a gift to the cigarette trade. And I'm starting to frame all of my regulatory submissions in that sort of language now. As for things like uh, short fills and all that, um, I think that's actually pretty difficult for them to get their heads around. I, I suspect that will travel under the radar. And even if they do alight on that, um, I'm pretty confident that uh, vaping companies will find regulatory workarounds of that type that will enable them to do sensible things for consumers that reduce the exposure to ridiculous regulations. Um, and you know, the vaping industry's proved itself pretty innovative at those kind of workarounds and long may it continue. Right, okay, we, we've got plenty of questions here and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not gonna get through them all, but well, please, if, 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 we don't, if we don't answer them here, Clive has already said that uh, he will try and find some way of answering them. Uh, we're hoping to put this up on YouTube and there'll be a chance to put your questions in there. So look out for our account and, and Clive said he'll, he'll answer them, but we'll get through as many as we can before we have to yeah, stop. Yeah, we've got one here from Jackie, or Ori, I, I hope I pronounced that right. It's something I don't know about. What's Clive's thoughts on the new stance by the WHO, who now seem to recognise that vaping is helpful to smokers, less harmful, etc., but stress the youth epidemic? Yeah, I it's don't know really interesting. I, I, I also noticed a, you know, maybe momentary, transitory, maybe it was a lapse, change in tone in one of the releases that came out. And I must admit, I was quite encouraged by that. Um, of course, all of that was swept away by the hysteria that we saw on World No Tobacco Day. But if I'm not mistaken, it's always important to remember that the WHO is two things, okay? There is the WHO itself, Tobacco Free Initiative, which is a very small group within WHO, uh, which produces the you know, Global Epidemic of Tobacco Report. It produces Q and A's. It did the e-cigarette, ludicrous e-cigarette Q and A earlier in the year. Um, it does World No Tobacco Day. It gives out awards and everything. That's WHO. There is also the Convention Secretariat, which is the Secretariat of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is a different entity. Sits outside WHO, in fact. It's funded separately, it's funded by the convention, parties to the convention, and it has recently had a change of leadership. And I'm not sure, but I, I have a feeling that that change of leadership may be a little bit more cautious and a little bit more open-minded, and at least that's what I'm hoping, uh, in the way that it approaches vaping. But again, who knows? Rejoice, some sort of- We won't something. really know if that was just a lapse or actually a change of a change of direction. But well spotted, I, I definitely thought there was something different in the way they expressed that. Uh, nice, nice to hear something even mildly positive on this at the moment. So yeah. great for that. Well, we'll go on to Philip Poisson, who, who's from Ethra. Uh, what do you think about the new WHO Europe report in context of the WHO and with TPD revision? Well, I mean, the, the, uh, I'm afraid I haven't uh, actually read the report in full um, because uh, it's pretty obvious what would be in it. They have, uh, WHO Europe uh, has generally been hostile. Um, the head of WHO, um, Roberto Bertolini, I think it still is, 
um, was incredibly hostile in the um, TPT2 negotiations. Um, the various regional offices are all doing these reports uh, as a way of working up the member states uh, for the COP9 process, and that's WHO Europe's um, uh, contribution. So I didn't see anything, and WHO Europe is quite uh, strongly affected by groups like European Respiratory Society and uh, other European-wide health organizations. So I didn't see anything particularly positive in it, but I didn't see anything that was kind of unpredictably worse than expected. Right, we've got two questions from Jessica Hardy, so I'm putting them together and um, we're, we're, we're rushing through them a little bit, but try and get as many as we can answered. Who are the allies we consumers need and how can we get them on side? And she also asks, what is the next engagement opportunity for consumers in the EU process? Which is a good okay. question, I think. Um, great question, Jessica. Um, I mean, the main allies uh, that consumers have is other consumers and the main app the main enemy is apathy amongst consumers. Okay, so building up a strong consumer movement with lots of people as individuals who are engaged, and lots of organizations like NNA and EFRA and their equivalents in the EU member states, that's the most important thing. Um, it's, also <laughs> it's also important to try to get um, uh, health professionals, uh, public health people, people involved in smoking cessation, anyone who looks as though uh, they have the slightest sign of being open to this, and there are many of them, they're not always as prominent as what we might hope, but there are many of them, drawing them into the advocacy uh, activity is really important if that's possible. Um, then, uh, yeah, I mean, basic, basically, try to make allies of your elected representatives, make sure members of parliament and, uh, and departments of health understand how much it matters to you. So yeah, build that, build that sort of coalition of the willing. But the key people are other vapors, um, the people who have social media channels, the reviewers, for goodness sake, if you're a reviewer, Please understand that everything is politics. It's not just about the products. You've got to engage in that as well. If you've got big followings, you need to engage them in the politics of this, not just talk about the latest device out of China. That is a good point, actually. We did have a couple of uh, registrations from, from reviewers or, or people who watch reviewers, and it'd be nice to get that message across to them that advocacy is something quite important because sometimes- yeah, Look, it's a get... totally important community. I mean, these, these are the people that can move move minds move opinions they un they understand they understand the politics that a lot more people understand the politics um you know and if you if you look at some of the early advocacy uh from the vaping community from say 2010 onwards it came from reviewers vaping enthusiasts becoming politicized and realizing this was a threat to the thing that they love in life sometimes the thing that is their business, certainly the thing that is their hobby, and it became active and politicized, got engaged. And if we can get those, if we can get those players, the ones with the big followings, not, not to bore their following with too much of this sort of stuff about the EU, but enough to engage them uh, in, in the politics, in the advocacy at the crucial moments, that I think is really important. Right, we've, we've, got, we've got an interesting question here. I'm not sure if, if there's anything they can do, but it's from Jay Blanche, who's, who's from THRA Canada, and she's asking any suggestions of how international partners can get involved. I'm not sure how, how they would get involved in the EU, but... Um, yeah, well, I, I, think, I think there's a lot to be said for kind of international networking. Um, you know, um, you know, what... <laughs> Um, it's not as if what, what goes on in Canada stays in Canada. Um, we, if we can, I mean, at one point, Canada had uh, potentially quite exemplary uh, legislation on the cards. It was going to have all these pro-vaping statements that it was going to allow companies to use and everything. And that could have been very helpful in the EU. Um, I think some pushback on the youth vaping epidemic narrative in Canada and um, 
We can't discuss it now, but I'm hoping we'll see some developments on that in in the next few uh, in the next few weeks, which will give Canadian advocates a bit of a lift up on changing the dynamic a bit in uh, in in Canada into something more popular, um, you know, more positive about vaping. And I think it's this our uh, this argument that we we have a sense of common cause. The arguments are the be the same being used everywhere. We have to hone those arguments and use the experience from other countries as advocates in the EU and the UK. Uh, and likewise, take what we've learned in Europe and use it in Canada. Not necessarily Canadians getting involved in the EU or Europeans getting involved in Canada, but a cross fertilization of the arguments and advocacy and insights and techniques that are used. Right, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to uh, Europe again now. We've got Kim Devilstein peterson from INCO has asked a question. Now, this is something that comes up occasionally. I'm not, sh I'm not sure how, how dramatic this is or not, but maybe you could tell us. This idea that if three or more countries legislate for a certain uh, regulation, that it's, it's kind of binding on the rest of the EU. So he's asking, what consequences would it have if three or more countries are legislating to restrict flavours to tobacco and menthol? That that's not the case. That that's no. that's not how the EU works. It, three or more countries can, you know, it, 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 I think there's a process there's a process within the directive um, that triggers a review if three or more countries um, uh, do do something. But in general, three or more countries doing something in the EU does not create a European Union legislation. What it, what it tends to do is attract the interest of the Commission, which then says, well, should we now pr produce proposals that harmonise across, uh, uh, across the EU? But in general, if three countries ban flavours, that wouldn't create a flavour ban in the EU. He, he, he kind of elaborates a little bit and says under the public health crisis argument. I, I don't know if that's something separate. I'm, I, like I said, it's not something I fully yeah, understand. Um, Is there that sort of thing? You know, if it's a public health crisis, can they can they say, well, because of this, we're going to do it all over Europe? Yeah, I mean, there is, so I'm just looking at the I'm looking away from the screen because I'm just looking at the text at the moment. I mean, there is. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, so in application, where there is something that's seen as a serious risk uh, to human health um, and three member states do it, the Commission shall be empowered to adopt delegated acts in accordance with Article 27. So delegated acts means that the Commission can come out and produce emergency uh, legislation. Um, no one has come close to doing that. Um, and they they have to. It's not that they it's not that they just regulate something like flavors. They have to say we're doing this because of a particularly serious health risk. So, for example, if there had been some agent found in um, uh, there'd been some agent found in e-cigarette liquids, you know, um, I mean, let's say Ivali had happened in actual e-cigarettes and not THC, then. That's the kind of thing that could have uh, triggered those sort of delegated acts. Um, you know, so uh, that, that is, that's how that's intended to be used. If it was overused, I think the commission, uh, the, the, there would be member states who would stop the commission doing it through judicial review or complaint to the European court, because generally the member states don't like the commission using delegated acts unless it's really in extremis okay so it really is an emergency measure and i don't think the normal business of banning flavors would come close to meeting the threshold for triggering that provision that there is in the directive presumably because it might come back and bite them at some point if someone else did something they didn't like it'd be it was it's yeah. a reciprocal thing isn't it yeah i mean you could get you could get a little group of uh, member states coming together to do something. I mean, it's still in the gift of the Commission um, to do this. Uh, you know, the Commission has to do a delegated act. It, it, it's not that the member states cause it to happen. They cause the Commission to look at it and decide whether they need to act. 
but the commission is reluctant to do that and the member states are reluctant to allow them uh, because they think that's giving too much power to the commission, which it is. So they would only do that to deal with an emergency situation. Right, right. We're, we're, we're very short on time. We're going to have to wrap it up, but there's a, a decent question to end on, I think. Uh, Liam Bryan has asked any predictions of what might be in the review. Now, leave us on something. Leave us with your most optimistic vision, Clive. Leave us with something. What's the, what's the best we can hope for out of this? Try and be positive and leave us with something good. Um, I don't think there's much chance of this, but I'm hoping <laughs> that there will be more. And this is where I will. This is where I think we should focus our work. There will be a higher awareness of the unintended consequences of excessive regulation in the sense that that protects the cigarette trade from competition. There will be some scepticism uh, about the so-called youth vaping epidemic in the United States. First of all, the interpretation of that, and hopefully we'll see some new papers on that fairly soon. Um, and then secondly, it's, applicable to the Euro it's applicability to the European Union. Um, I hope we will see, uh, um, it's really important to remember this, this is about the internal market. The directive is not, strictly speaking, a health directive. It's a directive about the proper functioning of the internal market with a high level of health protection. So I'm hoping that the champions of the internal market will also focus on competition um, and the importance of not using regulation to strangulate competition. And again, that's an argument I think we can have and win, possibly with other parts of the commission than DG Sante, which is the health body which leads on this. You know, there is the DG internal market, DG trade, who have an interest in competition and not using regulation to strangle small businesses. And that's an argument I think we might see in the mind hope we see in the review that's 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 a good note to end on clive so um thank, thank you very much we're gonna have to end it here i'm afraid sorry for everyone who didn't get their questions answered but like i said hopefully we'll put it on youtube and you can answer your, ask your questions there uh thank you clive very much for coming and speaking to us on this subject we we really uh recognize um you and and appreciate you spending your time to explain some of the intricacies of the eu uh, to everyone here, thank you also for attending as well. It's been some of your questions have been great to, to kick the discussion along. If you enjoyed this, we are planning to do more. We we are not doing anything next week because it's GFM, but we're hoping to organise something the week after. Uh, if you enjoyed it again, please donate to us uh, or follow us on our Facebook page. You can follow us on Twitter at, at NN Alliance. You can sign up as a supporter at uh, nnalliance.org to be added to our mailing list so you'd be given uh, notice hopefully of when these events happen just keep an eye on our social media for that as well find and subscribe to our youtube channel we are going to put these at some point on youtube and so you can watch them again you can ask your questions to clive as said as generously said he'll try and answer them and we may be streaming them in the future if we can uh, get everything sorted most of all we rely on the private donations i've, I've mentioned donating a, a lot obviously <laughs> we, need, we need the money Go to the donate page on the website, it lists plenty of ways that you can help. And of course, in the UK, simply text NNA and the donation amount to 7085. And that's open all the time. Of course, you can donate if you just feel like you like us one night watching a film, just get your phone out and send us some money. So I hope you've had a pleasant whatever time of the day it is where you are with some of the international people. Uh, but from the UK, I hope you have a good evening and hope to see you again next time. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.